it's Alice and welcome to our April wrap up. So in April, in case you missed it, if you have, where have you been? Uh, we read the entire YA book prize and we did a humongous reading vlog about it and we did a massive wrap up discussion about it. So things have been busy in April and I'm feeling pretty proud actually. We did the whole shortlist in like three weeks and it normally takes me six weeks and sometimes I'm still happy through the last book when they announce the winner. So smashed it, smashed it, happy about that. But in the grand scheme of things, how did our reading month actually go? Well, in April, we were aiming to read 5,538 pages. We actually read 6,216, which means we managed to read 112% of our page count target. I'm so happy. I cannot put into words how relieved I feel because I was reading my own books as well as the way book prize books and I had some review copies that cropped up unexpectedly. I just thought it was gonna be a massive mess. I didn't think that we were gonna get anywhere near to the target. So the fact that we have done it this well and I only found out when I was working out this morning, I was like, oh, I wonder how far under we are. So I was 700 pages over and I had no idea. So that's good, happy with that. If we're looking at star ratings, we've had a very good reading month. We had no DNFs, we had no one stars. We had two two star books, four three star books, seven four star books, that's really, really good, two 4.5 star books and three five stars. So this month we've had three five stars. In the first three months of the year, we'd only had two. So things are looking up. We are picking up some better books and things are going grand. So what I'm gonna start off this video by doing is giving you the star ratings for the YA book prize books that we read in the first half of the month. Because when we did our mid-month wrap up, which I will link for you somewhere, I wasn't giving ratings because we wanted to keep it a secret who we were gonna award the YA book prize, our YA book prize award to. So in that wrap up, I talked about Good Girl Bad Blood by Holly Jackson, which was a 4.5 star. And The Stars Are Burning Brightly by Danielle Duando, which was our other 4.5 star. The Great Golden by Meg Rossoff, which was one of our two stars. Cane Warriors by Alex Wheatle, which was a three star. And Eight Pieces of Silver by Patrice Lawrence, which was a four star. So that is the housekeeping out of the way. We are up to date on where we should be with ratings and things. Remind me to just never film a wrap up if I'm trying to do like a secret TBR and keep ratings secret because I will end up forgetting. And now we can move on with the books that we read in the second half of the month. The first of which was A Snowfall of Silver by Laura Wood. So this is a companion novel to A Sky Painted Gold, uh, which was Laura Wood's first YA novel. She normally writes middle grade. And this follows a girl called Freya, whose name I had already forgotten because I'm chronically bad at remembering character names. She runs away from home because she wants to be an actress. So she goes to stay with her sister Lou in London and she manages to join a touring theatre troupe. So they tour across the United Kingdom and she finally gets a taste of her dream. Uh, meanwhile, she is developing feelings for a guy. She thinks that she's finally gonna have her first big love story. Everybody's warning her away from him. Um, apart from her new best friend who is basically just telling her like, it's fine. If that's what makes you happy, then you do what makes you happy because I will support you. And he is bae. He's such a good best friend. And it's gorgeous. It is absolutely glorious. I loved this book. It is the perfect, even though I was reading it while it was blazing sun and it was really, really hot and warm and sunny outside, it still felt perfectly cozy and wintry. Um, they get snowed in at a theatre and so they get to have like a spontaneous sleepover and something about that just made me so happy. I was living for it. Didn't want to put this book down. There are some kind of deeper topics discussed. So about like falling short of your dreams and trying to succeed despite other people's expectations of you. So it's not all happy-go-lucky and bright and light-hearted, but I just think it was so perfect and it was exactly what I needed to read at this moment. And it was also the only book that was like this on the way but price shortlist. So a lot of the other shortlisted books were very issue-based, but this one was very much character-driven and just a riot, just a whale of a time. And I'm really looking forward to reading Laura Wood's other novel, Under a Painted Sky, because I've owned that for ages and haven't read it yet. But her writing just brings me such joy. 
The next book I'd like to talk about is Sent by Isabel Costello. This was another four star read for us. I was kindly allowed to reread and review this via NetGalley from Maswell Press, so a huge thank you to Maswell Press and to NetGalley. This follows a lady called Clementine. She is a perfumier and she is, she's kind of forced to do an interview to promote her perfume shop and this interview ends up getting the attention of somebody from her past. So her ex-girlfriend Raisha uh, turns up and they haven't seen each other since they broke up, their relationship ended very suddenly and we don't know how their relationship ended but we know that it ended with Rachel getting very very hurt and Clementine kind of outrunning the past. So there's an enigma there because you're jumping backwards and forwards, you start off in the present day with Clementine doing this interview and then you jump back and you get to see her love story with Rachel unravel um and so you get to see them meet and fall in love and you are just kind of driven very very quickly forward towards this inevitable explosion at the end of their relationship and i adored it so bisexual rep is very important to me and this hits the nail on the head clementine doesn't want to she kind of doesn't want to address her sexuality because she is married with two children. Her marriage is breaking down, her husband's been having an affair for a very long time, or having multiple affairs, but she just kind of pretends that that's what all marriages are supposed to be like, and she kind of kids herself into thinking that she's okay with it. Edward is not a nice person. He has very good character development, and I think that's the thing about this book, is that you can't help but like all of the characters, even if you don't want to like them. They're all really well fleshed out and they feel so realistic that you genuinely think you're reading about real people. So Isabel Costello has a huge talent when it comes to making realistic characters. Uh, I'm definitely going to be picking up more of her work in the future because I was blown away by that. Um, my only problem was that it ends in a way that I didn't want. So I'm not going to go into spoilers but I can see why Isabel Costello chose to end it the way that she did. It just wasn't what I wanted from the story and it made me feel a little bit deflated. That being said, I loved the kind of the story in the past, I love the story in the future, present, I loved the way that it was weaved together, every time there's like a lull in the present it's the perfect moment to jump back to the past and when you get a lull in the past it's the perfect moment to jump back to the present and it never feels like you're lingering in either timeline too long, it doesn't feel like it drags out, it doesn't feel like there's any bits that are kind of superfluous or unnecessary and I loved seeing Clementine learn to come to terms with her sexuality, I loved seeing Clementine addressing the kind of breakdown of her marriage with Edward and the way that they finally learned to communicate with each other. I thought it was very very powerful and I can imagine that, that will help a lot of people if they're reading it and they don't have the most stable relationship. Um, I can imagine that it would help a lot of people learn how to overcome those barriers in communication and this was just stellar. Like, if it only it had ended differently because I just I wasn't happy with the ending but other than that loved it. The next book that we finished in April was Melt My Heart by Bethany Rutter and this was a five star read for me. So what can I say about Melt My Heart other than the fact that I absolutely loved it? This follows a girl called Lily Rose. Her sister Daisy has a crush on a guy called Cal and Lily doesn't realise who her sister has a crush on until it's too late and she's already dating him. Drama. But Lily doesn't really feel the connection with Cal that she expects to feel. Like, this is her first proper relationship and she doesn't feel blown away or over the moon or the butterflies in her stomach feeling that she would be expecting to feel. And she begins to wonder whether she might actually have feelings for somebody else. And it's just told in such a brilliant way. I loved it. I absolutely loved it. So Lily Rose is a fat main character and it's very fat positive rep and that's great. So she, the, you literally start the book off and she is running and she's like, oh, I don't want to run. This isn't for me. And I love that because so many times in way in particular, the fat main characters are kind of forced to conform to society's image or like what society's like ideal image would be and it's to their own detriment and then it takes until the end of the novel before they're like oh actually I don't want to do this I'm happy being who I am and I loved the fact that Lily was apologetically happy being herself and apologetically like she just owned it she just owned it through the whole novel and there was like a little subplot that I wasn't a huge fan of because it seemed a bit pointless but when I was discussing it with Sean during our way but prize discussion he was like oh it's just a really good way of like putting her character in an uncomfortable situation and 
It's true. Like, there was one reason that I was, like, umming and eyeing between giving this a 4.5 and a 5. But Lily's character does undergo such good character development. She goes from being somebody who's very uncomfortable with standing up for herself, very uncomfortable with kind of asserting herself. She... I wouldn't say she's, like, shy, but she very much just kind of lets people get on with it. Like, she just doesn't really get actively involved in situations like that but by the end of the novel she's like smashing it she's ripping down posters and she's telling people to behave themselves more i'm trying not to get spoilery but yeah she just becomes so confident and i love seeing this development and it's also a story about a girl who doesn't want to go to university and in YA, it's such a controversial thing. Like, you either go to university or you really, really want to go to university or you regret the fact that you're not going to university. Like, just having a character be like, oh, I got in. Oh, no. I really wish I hadn't passed my exams. That's great. That's refreshing. And I loved it. And I highly recommend this. I, I highly, highly recommend it. Like, I already want to reread it. I liked it that much. The next book that we read was Wranglestone by Darren Charlton. This was another book for the YA Book Prize. And this and Melt My Heart also were both books that I accessed through NetGalley. So again, huge thanks to NetGalley for providing the service that they provide. Wranglestone is a post-apocalyptic novel. It follows a boy called Peter and his boyfriend Cooper. And there are zombies. And they live on these little islands in this like... And every winter the lake freezes and the zombies can get to them, so they have to be more careful. But Peter is very naive because he was born in this community, he's grown up here, he hasn't had any experience outside of Wranglestone. So he trusts strangers when he shouldn't and it causes lots of trouble. So the villagers kind of decide that Peter has to learn how to contribute more to the community by going outside of it and by braving the kind of wilderness. And it's a survival story, it's a love story, it's a horror story. And I really enjoyed it, but I, there was just something with the writing style that felt clunky to me. I struggled to understand some of the sentences, some of the things I could tell what Darren Charlton was saying, but the way that he was saying it just wasn't computing in my brain at all. Some of the metaphorical language, some of the descriptions, it was just completely going over my head. At times it felt like it was trying to be literary fiction, at times it felt like it was trying to be an adult post-apocalyptic novel. It didn't feel very YA, because YA, especially when it's YA that is so based in the action, it's normally so straightforward and easy to read, but it just felt... I don't know. It it just kind of felt a bit convoluted at points. I I am giving it three stars. I am still really excited to carry on with the second book of the series, which I believe is called Timber Dark. I don't know why. My brain can't ever remember if it's Timber Fell or Timber Dark, but I'm looking forward to carrying on with the series, and I'm going to reread this book then, because I feel like this is one that on a second reread it will just click into place, and because I'll know what's happening, and I'll know to expect this strange writing style and this bit of disconnect. I'll understand it and I'll appreciate it more in the end, but the on a first read, it can only get a three, which is a shame because I love the fact that it's a post-apocalyptic novel with a gay main character and a gay love story. And I can't think of a single other one that does that. And I really, really wanted this one to be a five star. I really wanted to love it. And I'm sad that I didn't. But again, very promising and looking forward to carrying on with the series. The next book I'd like to talk to you about today is Once in Future by Amy Reyes Capetta and Corey McCarthy. So this is a King Arthur retelling. It is futuristic and sci-fi. Um, Ari, who is our main character, is the 42nd reincarnation of King Arthur. So she finds Excalibur, she pulls it out of a tree and this wakes up Merlin who is somehow aging backwards. So instead of a really old Merlin like you would expect, he's actually like teenage verging on like prepubescent because with every Arthur that is found and reincarnated he ages down more. So this is basically his last chance. If Ari doesn't save the world and complete the Arthur loop um, Merlin's gonna be a baby and he's not gonna be able to help and the world is gonna be doomed forever. So I didn't think I was gonna like this one. I struggled with the first few chapters, I will be honest. I thought that it throws you into the world very, very quickly, but my brain was struggling to compute. But as soon as Merlin came into the story and it started focusing more on the Arthurian elements rather than on the futuristic humans have left Earth, this corporation has kind of taken over, everything's sponsored by them, they own basically everything, and our main characters are on the run from them because 
One of them is from a planet which rebelled against the corporation. They've been sealed in like a bubble. She managed to be sealed outside of the bubble. So she's been hunted basically her whole life because of who she is. And that's an interesting dynamic, but it's a lot to get your head around at the start. But when you start exploring a bit more deeply, when you get to know the characters more, you get more of the backstory, you get to see why, like how Ari is feeling about being dispossessed from her family and from her homeland and like she's never been able to go there she can't remember anything from her childhood because it was so traumatic the way that she was found and as you're getting to know her more and getting to know her story more you just I couldn't help falling in love with these characters I loved her relationship with Gwen so Gwendolyn is a queen on like a little planet that is doing like medieval it's like um the medieval reading constructions so they it's like so futuristic obviously but they purposefully wear the clunky armor and like the peasant outfits because they want to be part of the medieval time period so that's really cool but Ari and Gwen get married and I love their relationship oh I just love it there's so many nice little things in here like there's the fact that when Ari finally gets back to her home planet she is stuck there for a year um, so there's like a gap in the story um, where you get like a year later so you get to see how the characters have changed because they think that she's dead so you get to see the character development when she's not there you get to see her develop her character when she's on her own and she hasn't got the safety net of her brother and then Merlin makes this really nice little comment if he's like oh I think she's like learnt the kitchen hair care secrets and I thought that was just like a really nice little nod to the fact that like different cultures have different ways of treating their hair and treating their skin and things. There is a main character in here whose name I can't remember off the top of my head because there's lots and lots of characters in here. This is like quite a big cast of characters. Um, well, where is he going to be? Where are they going to be? Sorry. Lamb. So Lamb is described as fluid. Um, so in this futuristic world people just accept gender fluidity and they accept kind of non-binary characters and it's just implicitly accepted there is no questioning there is this bit where Merlin's like oh on the earth that I'm from we kind of just assume people's genders based off of the way that they look and they're like oh that's so like old that's such an old-fashioned thing and I genuinely hope that we get to a stage where that is the way that people act about gender fluid and gen like non-binary people because it costs nothing to remember people's pronouns and just remembering to correct yourself and taking a second and just caring about the way that people want you to talk about them is just really important and I love the fact that it's just so implicitly accepted in this novel there's like not even a question they're all so supportive and accepting and caring about their friend that they just call Merlin out on it and he automatically is like okay I'm sorry I made a mistake I'll fix that I just think that's great like it's lots of little things but like they're not done in preachy ways they're just done so like oh this is a thing let's move on it's not like preaching or hammering the point home it's just accepted and it's just a natural part of the story and it's a natural part of the world and then you just move on to the rest of the story and that's the way to do diverse rep that is the way to do like stories with diversity in them you don't have to hammer it home and be like oh my world's really special because it's different it's different there's like a wide range of characters just have that wide range of characters and just be like this is the way that it is because that's the way that it should be um but yeah I didn't love it I didn't give it five stars because as I said like there were sections especially where it was like Ari's sections there were sections that I found a bit slow and clunky and I struggled to get my head into the second half I read in a day um from the midway point onwards was just such a breeze and so easy to get through it was just kind of the beginning I've already put the second book on my May TBR because I'm really excited to carry on with this series and get it finished so yeah like it it definitely ends in a way that it's hard to put down and it's impossible not to carry on with the duology. The next book I'd like to talk about is Hold Back the Tide and this was another five star for us. This is by Melinda Salisbury. So there's a girl called Alva. Her father is a murderer and she decides she wants to leave because she has played by the rules of living with a murderer for her whole life or like since he became a murderer and she is tired of 
walking on eggshells. She is tired of doing absolutely everything and basically being her father's slave just so that he won't kill her. And she's ready to go until one night she gets back to her cottage and there is a monstrous being outside her home. And they have like four sets of, two sets of teeth. Um, they have completely pale skin. In my head, I kind of imagine it like Jar Jar Binks. Like, they have, like, the nose slits and, like, the kind of, like, serpentile eyes. Um, so I imagine them as, like, really pale versions of Jar Jar Binks. Sean says he doesn't get that vibe at all, but I get that vibe. So in my head, this is just an albino Jar Jar Binks murdering. But Alva has to decide whether she still wants to leave or whether she wants to stay and help rescue the village where she has grown up from these monsters and it just blew me away i absolutely loved it i cried and i don't cry very often at books as soon as i finished it i was like i'm weeping and i didn't expect this and i just don't have enough words to explain how much i loved it i my the weird thing about it is i gave it five stars but even without the supernatural element, I probably would have given it five stars because up until the monsters are involved, it was such a gripping story and you just want to know like who her dad's killed and how she knows he's a murderer and why she's like going to get away and is she going to get away? And there's a relationship that's developing between her and one of the people in the village and you're like, oh no, you're developing a relationship but you're about to leave. What are you going to do? And it's so gripping. And then all of a sudden there are paranormal elements and supernatural things and monsters and this would have probably been a five star story for me even if it had just been a historical novel about a girl whose father is a murderer and then there's all these extra elements added in and i just loved it i loved it and i don't know how to express how much i loved it in words because i really really did and it's the kind of book i already want to reread it's the kind of book i want a sequel to or a companion novel to and felt special while I was reading it. The first 25 to 50% we flew through and I didn't want to put it down and it just completely immersed me in the story. It swept me away and I wanted Alva to be my best friend. I wanted to be Alva. Like I, I just wanted to live this story completely and utterly because it was so impactful and I just loved it. I have nothing else to tell you. Um, it's great it's really really great and if you're looking for a supernatural standalone if you like books that are set in scotland if you like books that are historical but don't have like a specific time period it's just kind of vaguely historical feels pick it up read it you'll love it it's an unusual monster i'm still not sure whether it's based in scottish mythology or if it is like a unique monster like whether it is a retelling of an old folk tale or whether it is something completely new but it's something i've never read before it's just fascinating and i loved it so read it read it. <laughs> the next book I'd like to talk about is Loveless by Alice Oseman. This is a four star for us. I've actually bumped this up the first time I read it. It was 3.5 stars. Um, follows a girl called Georgia. She goes to university. She discovers her sexuality and she begins to get to grips with who she is and accept the fact that perhaps not wanting romantic relationships and not really being interested in sex isn't that big of a deal and it can be a realistic genuine choice for people. Again, I loved it. I still find it a bit slow and I still find it a bit too intensely focused on Georgia. So I love the cast of characters but it doesn't feel very authentic as like uh, we have just gone to university because there isn't really any discussion about getting to terms with campus or getting to terms with the lectures or the kind of auditoriums, things like that. It's very focused on the fact that they make a Shakespeare society and they want to put on this play. There's little references to the fact that like, oh, Rooney sat next to me in a lecture but when I went to university one of the things that was like vastly different for me was like how different the classes were compared to sixth form and secondary school. So I was surprised that there wasn't at least some kind of mention or exploration of that. I know obviously Alice Oseman is telling a very focused story here but it it just didn't really feel like the university thing was really needed. Like, it could have easily been somebody going from secondary school up to college, like, moving to a college in, like, a new area, or going to a college where, like, not many of your friends have been. So it would have been nice if there had been a bit more of the focus on the university. There's, like, a lot of exploration of Freshers Week and, like, all the drinking stuff. But, again, it just didn't... I don't know. 
something about that just doesn't really feel necessary. That being said, I think this is a very important book. If you're looking for books about asexuality or about being a romantic, then this is definitely one I would recommend. I hope that there are more way books about asexuality and aromantic characters in the future because it's very important to see. And like props to Alice Sazon for writing a book like this. And I've already said, I've said it before, I'll say it again. I think this will be the YA Book Prize winner. It wasn't my personal winner. You'll have to watch our vlog to find out who that was. But I definitely think it's going to be the winner because this is something special, it's completely new and it's going to help a lot of people. The next book I'd like to talk about is Kate in Waiting by Becky Albertalli. I read this one as part of a blog tour so a huge thanks to The Right Reads for allowing me to get involved in this blog tour. It follows a girl called Kate. Her and her best friend Anderson have always had communal crushes and so they go off to theatre camp in the summer, they fall in love with a guy at camp, they like talk about him all the time, they're both absolutely obsessed with him but then he like they leave at the end of the summer camp and they just go back to their normal lives and the guy kind of stops existing but this year their communal crush ends up joining their school because it turns out his mum is best friends with Kate's mum or they were best friends at the same theatre camp when they were younger so when her marriage breaks down Ellen who is the Matt's mum decides to move her and Matt to the same town where her best friend lives so Matt and Kate and Anderson are suddenly colliding again and they are all taking part in the same theatre production which is Once Upon a Mattress and Kate and Matt are love interests in the play and so her and Anderson are both falling rapidly in love with this guy and they have to have this conversation of like will our friendship be able to survive this can we actually be happy for each other if one of us starts dating him will the other be fine with it what will we do and I just thought it was a really important look at friendship and it's quite similar to Loveless in some ways which is ironic because obviously Loveless is completely centered on asexuality and not having romantic relationships and this is focused on two characters being in love with the same person but the way that the friendship is the most important thing and the friendship is the be all and end all and friends are so important that they're basically family nothing will come between you it doesn't matter if it's like sacrificing other things for that friendship that is the important thing those discussions are really important to be having and i loved that aspect of it i'll be honest like considering it's two characters in love with the same character i thought it was going to be a bit kind of love triangly. I didn't think I was gonna love it as much as I did but I really enjoyed it. There were a few pop culture references that felt a bit outdated so at times it feels like this could have been released five years ago even though it literally came out like last week, the week before. So that threw me out with the story quite a little bit because I just wasn't expecting there to be these like random bits that like kind of removed me from the situation but all in all enjoyable. Um, it definitely made me miss doing theatre. I just want to do a musical now. I regret not taking part in more when I was at secondary school because they were so much fun and I like to be part of the cast and just getting to see all of these characters. This is another one that has nice diverse rep because you've got a trans character, you've got a Latina character and they're just like best friends with the main characters. Obviously Anderson is gay because he's in love with Matt and you've just got like this nice diverse cast of characters, they're all friends, they don't judge each other, they're all just implicitly accepted and it's just nice and relieving to not have like the coming out story be the focus, just to have gay characters, trans characters just existing happily in a world where they don't have their sexuality as like the main kind of story that's being told. Obviously Becky Albertalli is very very known for Simon versus the Homo Sapiens Agenda which is about call a boy called Simon who is closeted gay and decides to come out after some coercion. I don't feel as though that's a spoiler because most people have read it by now but it's nice that considering Becky Albertalli wrote that story it's nice that she's now writing a story that's like completely different where it's just got like gay character completely accepted. Um, and also I loved the Jewish rep in this one because Kate is Jewish and Becky Albertalli is Jewish so you could tell that she was writing from the heart. There are lots of little references to things like Chala and Bar Mitzvahs and going to Temple and things like that and it's just, it's just a well-rounded story with well fleshed out characters and it was very enjoyable. So four stars for Kate and Winting. So I've got three more books for you today. I'm sorry this is taking a while but we read an awful lot in the second half of the month. The first of those books is The Ruby Locket by Melissa Wren. This follows two characters. Um, one is called Karina. She is found by Saxon who is our other main character. She's found unconscious in a desert. He thinks that she is dead. 
realises she's still alive, so he takes her into their home, but she is somebody who is called a rambler. So if they find, like, the, the kind of government in charge, find out that they've let her into their home, they're going to get in lots and lots of trouble. So, Karina has no memories. Saxon doesn't know whether to trust her or not. Um, you get dual perspective, like, jumping between each of their viewpoints every single chapter. And you get to follow Karina as she uncovers her memories. She discovers she's part of a race called the Okaji. It's people who have been injected with this thing that kind of gives them superpowers, super strength, fast healing. Not like actual superpowers, just like generally better human. And she is part of this like race of people. And she's being hunted by someone. They're not sure who, they're not sure why. Um, but Saxon and her kind of embark on this mission to find out who is after her and to get her home. I I gave this one three stars. I was honestly just bored, like a lot. The chapters were too short because of the constant switching between the characters. And it was like 113 chapters or something ridiculous in this book. It would have been better if they had combined a few more together. So if, say, like two or three of Saxon's chapters became one of Saxon's chapters, and then like four or five of Queen of chapters became one of hers, and you didn't have to look at all the same events from both of their perspectives, because it throws you out of the story a lot, it's very disjointed, and it just wasn't engaging. I liked the concept, and I thought that the action was written very well. So there's lots of kind of running away from the people who are chasing them. It's it's very much like a classic dystopian in that way. It's also Australian YA, so it's set in a location which isn't explored very often in dystopias. And it is set like many, many years after something called the burn has happened. And I was very intrigued about that. I wish it had been explored a bit more deeply because it did sound very, very fascinating. But the way that this new world has been crafted is very interesting. It was just kind of the, the the constant changing of perspective was my main issue with it. There's also, I try not to hold like editing errors against the book because like these things are easy to miss, like these things can slip through, but it's told in first person and then all of a sudden there'll be like a random third person pronoun in there. So it'll be like, oh, she touched my shoulder like, she took her hand away from his shoulder. Like, no, 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 she's got her hand on your shoulder. She's taking her hand away from your shoulder. And it's just little things like that. It kind of muddied the story and it made it a little bit harder to understand what was going on because sometimes you're like, oh, I thought, like, this had happened. It, it Not, like, something as simple as, like, touching the shoulder. But, you're like, you when there's the busier action scenes, you think that something's happened and then you get thrown out of it with this, like, change in pronoun, change in writing style. And then you realise it's just a mistake and then you've got to kind of reread it again to piece it together properly. Um, that frustrated me a little bit. It's probably closer to a 2.5 if I'm honest. It's like just dead exactly in the centre. I didn't hate it. I didn't love it. It didn't make me angry. I was just bored. And normally, yeah, like, I was a bit meh. I think that people will enjoy this one. I think that, again, like, the idea of the OKD, the idea of this, like, finding a uh, injection, like finding a vaccine that's meant to give people more nutrients, more strength because the human race is like dying and then having it mark them with like this tattoo and then people starting to like exploit these stronger humans. I thought that was like a fascinating concept and really well crafted world. It was just mostly the writing style that threw me out. Um, but yes, three stars for this one. I'd also like to talk about Bridge of Souls today by Victoria Schwab. I have literally no idea where I've put my copy of this one since we finished it, but just pretend I'm holding it. <laughs> so this is the third and final book so far in the Cassidy Blake series by Victoria Schwab. This one gets a four star from us. I gave the first two books in the series five stars each, and this one, although I enjoyed it, it just didn't give me the same kind of chilly, creepy vibe. Like, both of the other ones have, like, properly spooked me. I've been sat there and I've like actually jumped and I felt like shivers down my spine and I've been very on edge and very tense. Even though they're middle grade ghost stories, they've really given me that palpable reaction. This one didn't do the same for me. I felt like there was too much going on. I loved the setting of New Orleans and I loved the way that it was explored, especially through the lens of a 12 year old. So like Madame Lola Reed's house, the way that she like talks about it, 
she's very uncomfortable with what goes in on there so she won't go into it and she just doesn't really want to think about it and I think that's very realistic for someone that young right you wouldn't want to know that people were that horrendous you wouldn't want to know that things that terrible happened so I thought that was very authentic I'm gonna be honest my main issue with this one is that there's just like 10 tons of Harry Potter references and like I wouldn't normally have a problem with that but it's to the detriment of the story so one of the characters, their only real description is she looks like Luna Lovegood, but grown up. And that you don't really get a sense of the character that way. And it just frustrates me a little bit because Victoria Sharp's really talented. I love her books. This is the third one in the series that I've read. This is the fifth or sixth of hers overall that I've read. And I've really enjoyed all of them. But it just felt really lazy. You're like relying on somebody else's character descriptions to describe your character and then just saying, oh yeah, but older. And I know that kids like Harry Potter. And I know that kids like referring to things using that lens of things that they're comfortable with and familiar with. But it just doesn't feel authentic. And it threw me out of the story a lot. Like, there are lots of, like, what Hogwarts House are you references at the beginning. There's, like, a random reference to, like, Neville's Remember All. But it doesn't really make any sense in the context. It's like, oh, I need to... Like, she has a string so that she won't forget that she's going into... I don't want to get spoilery. Basically, it's like the veil. Um, so in this world, she like steps into like the veil. She'd go to the other side like, with the ghosts. She's going to like another location like that. And she has a red string around her wrist so that she won't forget that she is only visiting. She doesn't belong there. And then it's like, oh, like Neville's remember all that helps him remember. But like, he can't remember what he's forgotten. Okay. Yeah, sure. Just like that. Whatever. And there's random references to the spooky ghost things that like eat your soul and it just makes me think like was Victoria Sharp just trying to write Harry Potter but in a much shorter novel and with less magic because it just doesn't feel authentic and it it really disappointed me for the third book in the series when I've given the first two five stars each I was expecting to give this one five stars I still gave it four stars because I thought that I still loved the characters I thought the story was quite fun it wasn't like a massive thing but it's all I can really remember about the story is just these constant Harry Potter references and it just makes me really disappointed because I thought Victoria Schwab was better than relying on a different author's creations but that's just me I guess anyway last book now this one's gonna get a ranty one so we are gonna don't make this as short as possible this is heaven has no regrets by tessa schaefer this was another one through netgalley hated it i gave it two stars i'm still tempted to drop it down to one star but this is the story of two cousins uh faith and mackenzie and one of them dies so the novel starts off with a chapter from one of their perspectives we don't know which one it's not specified talking about the dead one we don't know which one it's not specified and then you jump back and it's both of their perspectives so you're getting to know them but you constantly know that one of them is dead and you on the like alternate timeline you're following them as they're getting ready for the funeral they're coming to terms with the death they're going to the funeral um but actually in the kind of main bulk of the story you're following faith and Mackenzie through like three or four years of their lives and there are like little italic segments at the beginning of each chapter about grief and the way that grief affects you and about loss and ideas of heaven and those bits are really impactful those bits were thought provoking and if this had just been a book with those kind of quotes and thoughts in it it would have been a fine star because it does make you think more about loss and the way that you react to grief and the way that you feel when you lose someone and those are very powerful subjects but Faith and Mackenzie's story, I just hated it. So Faith has Crohn's disease. So when you join her, she's in hospital. She is bleeding a lot when she uses the bathroom. And so you think that obviously that's going to be what kills her. But then you jump to Mackenzie and she has bulimia and she is purging pretty much constantly. And you think, oh, that's going to be what kills her. And... It means that you don't, or at least I didn't, find myself really caring about either of these characters because I just wanted to get to the bottom of which one died. And I think if it had been like, oh, this character is mourning this character 
and then you went back in time and you got to meet them and you realised which one was dead and you knew, like, oh my gosh, this loss that they're going to experience. And you got to see them kind of helping each other through these tough times while always knowing which one of them was dead. I think it would have been much more impactful, but because it was made into like a mystery, it cheapened the impact. Um, this has so many five star reviews on Goodreads and I don't understand it because it's very, very triggering. Like there are trigger warnings for bulimia and eating disorders, obviously, but there are very graphic descriptions of Mackenzie purging. Like, I mean graphic as in how she is shoving her fingers down her throat, the way she is doing it, the feel of the stomach acid, the burn. Um, it's very, very triggering. And as somebody who was not expecting that because it doesn't really mention anything about that in the description and if I had known that those descriptions were going to be in here I would not have requested this book. Um, hated it. Um, there's like this really weird bit where Faith's like I'm not going to take my medication every time that you purge. Blackmailing your cousin who is like your best friend. Oh yeah no I'm not going to take my medication for my disease that I have if you succumb to your mental illness. That's asshole move. I hated that. That made me so angry. And it's even just like little things. It's based in a true story. So I feel like an asshole for hating it. I feel like such a heartless cow. But like in the acknowledgements at the end, the author's like, oh, to the boy with the mohawk, the boy with the motorcycle, the girl with the tattoo, the girl with the dimples. Like this story is for you. Thank you for helping me through this at the time. But like you can take those characters that you know in real life, those people who have those defining characteristics, you can make them into characters in your story and you can give them names, you can flesh them out and you can give them dimples and you can give them a mohawk or a motorcycle and then you'll still know who you're referring to and those people will still know who you're referring to but will have more of a sense of character. Like, literally her boyfriend, she's just like, oh, the boy with the motorcycle came over to me. The boy with the mohawk kissed me. Like, the girl with the tattoos held my hand. So, you're telling me the only named characters we get in this entire novel are Faith and Mackenzie? Yeah. They're the only named characters. You have the parents and the grandparents. Don't have names. Aunts and uncles, galore, don't have names. Friends all over the place, none of them have names. It's lazy. And I don't care if it's meant to be impactful. I don't care if it's meant to be paying homage to people that you know in real life. It's lazy. And it was so hard to keep track of who was who. It was so hard to care. There's a random reference to the fact that, like, the girl who survives is taking out her contact lenses. In the, like, named chapters, only one of them has contact lenses. And that is not the one who survives. That is the one who dies. So either the other one has contact lenses and it's just mysterious and it doesn't get mentioned at all to add to the kind of mystery. Or that's a mistake. And that's, like, it doesn't add up properly. It's, it just annoys me. It annoys me a lot. This book was putting me in a very bad place. It was very long. It dragged a lot. There's lots of like never ending kind of ruminations on death and depression. And even before the death and depression, there's like constant ruminations on like family and belonging and being left behind. And oh, it's so boring. The first line of dialogue is spoken 8% into the novel. You get 8% in and it's just people rambling. 8%? And you're only just speaking? Like, yeah, I just didn't care for this one. I'm just gonna stop there because otherwise I'm just gonna get progressively angrier. I do think I'm gonna end up dropping it down to a one star, but it doesn't, it doesn't feel like a one star, but it also feels like I should have DNF'd it 10% in and just forgotten it existed because if it hadn't been... I think I was on like either 50 or 60% when the graphic descriptions of the purging occurred. If I hadn't been that far in, I would have put it down then. If that had been earlier, I would have just been like, no, this is not the book for me because it made me feel horrendous and it shook me to my core. My mental health plummeted and I still forced myself to finish it because it's a review copy and I felt obligated to. So Alice is not kind to herself. Woohoo! But yeah, we're going to review this one. I'm going to like write a full review on the blog, see how I'm sitting at the end of it. Either a one or a two star. Probably a one star. But I wouldn't recommend this one at all. Um, and the fact that they've got like loads of five stars on Goodreads, don't listen to them, they're wrong. Um, it's just not, it's not good. It's not good at all. So, finishing on that really super duper happy note, this was my April wrap up. So, we read, I don't even know how many books in April, I did not count them. Let me count them for you now. 18! 
18 books in April. I'm pretty chuffed with that. So it's not quite a book a day. But considering we had like a very ambitious TBR and there's only a couple of books that we missed off of it and I'm going to try and like roll those over, carry them on. But we still read the page count we were aiming for, even though I did have random review books pop up in the middle of the month. Otherwise I would have read the books I was supposed to. That's fine. It's fine. It's fine. But yes, I hope you liked this video. If you did, then please give it a like. If you would like to subscribe, we would be super duper grateful. We post new videos every Tuesday, Thursday and Saturday. They're normally shorter than this. So... <laughs> I'm really sorry that this got so long, but I hope that you enjoyed it anyway, and we will see you again soon. Bye! But I've already put the second book on my April TBR. May.